Um, I guess I'll start with telling you all a little bit about this book and then reading um, just a couple of pages from it. So um, I really adore Michael's description already, but some of the, my own words to describe this book are, I really set out to write a new American epic because I always grew up loving Westerns and sort of the mythology of the American landscape, its grandness, but never saw anybody like myself or my family reflected in them. Um, so this book starts out with Sam and Lucy, who are two children of immigrants, and one day they discover that they just wake up and discover that their father has died in the night. So now they're in this really hostile Western mining town um, where the townspeople are against them. There's an incident with a gun and suddenly they're just off and running, trying to survive and trying to find a place to bury their father. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the book where they've been searching for a place to give their father a proper burial for a while. Um, and they find something. They've nearly reached the foot of the mountains one week later when the rib in the sky thickens. Wolf moon, rarest kind. Bright enough that after sunset and star rise comes moonrise. Silver prize, their eyes awake. The blades of grass, the bristles of Nellie's mane, the creases of their clothes illuminated. Across the grass, an even brighter glow. The two still sleeping, they rise from their blankets and walk. Their hands brush. Did Sam reach across? Or is it a coincidence of strides grown similar thanks to Sam's new height? The light comes from a tiger skull. It's pristine, the snarl and touched. Chance didn't place the skull. The beast didn't die here. Mother bones surround it. The empty sockets face east and north. Follow gaze and Lucy sees the very end of the mountains where the wagon trail curves to the plains. It's, Lucy says, heart quickening, a sign, Sam says. Most times Lucy can't read Sam's dark eyes. Tonight the moonlight has pierced Sam through, made Sam's thoughts clear as the blades of grass. Together they stand as if at a threshold, remembering the tiger Ma drew in the doorway of each new house. Ma's tiger like no other tiger Lucy has seen a set of eight lines suggesting the beast only if you squinted, a cipher. Ma drew her tiger as protection against what might come, singing lahu, lahu. Ma drew her tiger in each new home. Song shivers through Lucy's head as she touches the skull's intact teeth, a threat or else a grin. What was the last word of the song? A call to the tiger, lie. What makes a home a home, Lucy says. Sam faces the mountain and roars. And all the rest of that night, the wind blows with particular fierceness, blows straight through Lucy's threadbare dress and blanket, down her throat and into her hollows so that she's cold from the inside. A slapping wind, quick gusts against her cheeks. It means the rainy season is coming. Though coming's too strong a word, unless it's meant as Ba meant it, saying I'll come home tonight, and meaning the next morning, the next night, the next Monday, red-eyed and fuming with whiskey. Rain's coming in the way Ba was and was not coming, a far-off brooding cloud. While Sam sleeps, the wind blows loud enough to keep Lucy awake. A wind unlike the daytime wind, a wind like a voice, low and blustering through the grass. Ah, the wind says and sometimes or, and sometimes in, sometimes on, then done. Can't sass wind or beg wind, so Lucy does what she's learned to do, keep quiet. She lets the wind batter her and sting her eyes. She lets the wind blow gifts from far off places. Withered leaves it brings, long fingered as hands. Fine dirt that yellows her hair. Gifts or warnings, smells of wet and rot. Cicada husks, which on first reckoning she mistakes for fingers and toes, which on third, fourth, fifth reckoning she takes for the ghosts of fingers and toes. The haunting comes in the way the wind blows down her throat with vengeful force, fills her ears with words she won't dare remember by day. Ah, the wind screams, claiming her with coldness. Ah, the wind screams, we are. Winds blowing up and as Sam sleeps, Lucy sits and listens listens, listens. And then it is day, Sam has the shovel, Lucy the ladle. Very old sure another recipe, Ma said. Ready, Sam says. And Lucy says to herself, remember how he taught us to prospect. Remember how his wrists were spotted with oil burns. Remember his stories, 
Remember his nails bitten to the quick. Remember how he snored when he drank. Remember his white hairs. Remember his bluster. Remember how he loved pork cooked with peppers. Remember the smell of him. They dig a hole the size of a pistol. They dig the size of a dead baby. They dig the size of a dog. They dig the size of a girl who wants only to lie down and rest. They dig though there's soon space enough for a rucksack, two rucksacks, four. They dig and the grave takes on a shape like the one inside Lucy, a hollow filled with the smell of loam and morning breath. They dig till sun crawls down the backs of the hills, drops shadow over the lip of the grave. Coward, the wind says sadly. Lucy knows better than to talk back. Sam opens the sack. Ba falls in a jumble, no hope of straightening him. Already the soil, so dry and so thirsty, is drinking him up. He sinks. Where will he go? Down to mix in a common murk alongside Ma's bones in the grave Lucy saw. We'll stop there. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, I'm going to clap because I feel like it, and everybody else can clap. <laughs> um, so much for that. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, ask you to expand on something that you said earlier um, and just, you know, talk about, you know, why the West and why a story, you know, set kind of in this time period um, inside of this tradition, uh, what inspired you to, to do that? Yeah, so um, I spent, a, this book is not at all autobiographical. Clearly, I did not live in like in a reimagined 1800s. Um, but my family did move a great deal across the country. And one really memorable trip for me was the move from Lexington, Kentucky to Salinas, California. And I remember I was really lonely. I was really scared. I was, you know, going to new schools. I was an outsider. But one thing that was always a balm to me was just the beauty of the landscape. Um, America is like a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And there's a ferocity and a desolation to that beauty too, that I felt really resonated with like the intensity of emotion I was experiencing. Um, and I grew up reading, you know, the works of John Steinbeck, the works of Laura Engel Wilders and Mary McMurtry. And I always admired how the like traditional Western when it's done well sets, you know, very small mundane people up against this backdrop and then sort of shows you how epic their lives are. And I wanted that for, for people who weren't white men. Mm -hmm. And yeah, no, we got it. And it's amazing. Um, I, uh, I guess like my follow-up question is just um, something I really admired was this balance you achieved in this book where um, you write about a past which centers uh, people who have been you know, ignored uh, and or erased, you know, especially in the telling of this past. Um, but it also feels of the time and also does not impose, I feel does not impose a contemporary consciousness onto the characters, um, especially, you know, with regards to like say race and gender identity. And I wondered um, how was the writing of that for you? Like the thought process and how, how did you kind of uh, achieve that balance so well? Yeah, honestly, um, one is like, I don't think I, some people have asked whether I, you know, deliberately set out to put into uh, contemporary issues like feminism and racism um, and sort of gender politics into this book. And I, I didn't because I feel like these issues aren't new. It's just that we weren't always talking about them. They weren't always in like a collective conversation. Um, so there's that. And then as far as not imposing like, you know, my own values or the values of 2020 on them, that was like a little bit of a struggle because I think uh, in the first draft, I'm, I'm always very close to the characters. And I think you have to be really close to the characters to do your duty by them. Um, but the characters have like, frankly, like very fucked up ideas and thoughts because of the time period that they're living in. Um, one, one sort of topic that I wanted to explore in this book was like, how harmful one the model minority myth can be to um, young Asian children and how toxic it is to have your sense of identity and yourself warped by a desire to assimilate into whiteness and like quite frankly to sort of disappear into whiteness and so that's obviously something I don't believe is a good thing personally but some of the characters in this book struggle with that um, and I had to really stay true to the time period and to the what was going on in the characters' own minds and not in mine. Mm -hmm. um, 
just another uh, feature of, um, you know, one of the genres this book is in conversation with, right? The Western, like, I think you write landscape in the natural world so amazingly. Uh, as somebody who is often bored by landscape, um, I mean, I guess right now I'm like, I hate outside, yet I so desperately want to go out into it. So perhaps that's another way in which this book was like so intoxicating to read, like around this time. But um, I think that one of the things that really struck me about how you write nature is that um, there is this sort of like attention paid to the struggles of every last creature in the world. Um, like there is a almost like half of a sentence like very early on, so it's not a spoiler, but you know, like Lucy brings in this squirrel, right, by the campfire. And it's, it's sort of mentioned that she found this squirrel trying to climb a tree with a broken paw. And just that little half sentence kind of made me feel like, you know, very sad for the squirrel, but also, you know, it's sort of like the brutality is present, um, but also, you know, this tenderness, right? Um, you know, the characters need to survive. They, they kill animals, they hurt, they hurt other creatures, um, including humans. And um, I was just wondering if sort of this attention kind of paid to all these different creatures and, and just sort of a whole environment ecosystem is something that you tried to put in there or if it's like something that came out because it's uh, kind of a part of you. Mm. Um, so I will start off by saying that I also kind of hate the outdoors. <laughs> I think it's beautiful, but uh, I've said before that I think my very favorite, favorite outdoor experience in my life was once I went to this art museum in Tokyo and they had this production of just like trees moving in a forest with wind sounds, but you got to sit on like a really comfy beanbag chair and like watch it. There were no bugs or anything. So that was my favorite outdoors experience no ever. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no bugs. Um, so I actually think I write about the outdoors partly because it, it terrifies me. Um, and I think that for me personally, writing into the things that give me horror, that, um, that like there's some like friction with my mind is what's most interesting. Um, and so when I look at the outside world, I don't think, I think it is like a, it's a pretty brutal place. Um, and I don't think that most of us, certainly not myself included, are like fit to survive out there. And that's, that's kind of like something that's always under the surface every time I'm like outdoors or like hiking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like, I'm not going to spoil the context, but like there's even a moment to talk about bugs which we all hate, or at least, <laughs> like, uh, you, you, there, there's sort of, you evince sort of this empathy for uh, maggots and, and flies. Uh, and I, I just think that is an incredible act of kind of just, uh, you know, finding a way to not obsess over what like a maggot is thinking, but just recognizing that um, if, if you do something, it has an effect on uh, something else in your environment. Um, and I thought that was incredible, so. Um, even though you hate yeah. the outdoors, but. I hope there are no entomologists listening into this conversation, not to like hate on bugs too much. Um, but I think, yeah, the other thing that like, I couldn't help thinking about that in this book, which is probably technically like a more contemporary issue is just like how much damage humans have done to the environment. And I think that's probably where part of the sympathy comes from. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so much destruction and so much that is lost all the time and mm -hmm. just, being a human alive in 2020 and having that somewhere in in my life um did bleed into the book mm -hmm. um i guess yeah just to talk about you know the natural landscape a little more um i don't think it's a spoiler to say that there are animals present in this america which uh i would not have known to be indigenous to the states uh they're not like you know just like a jackal jackals for instance and i um, I thought like just just the role those animals and even you know whether it was like actually seeing them or just hearing tell of them um, the role they played was so interesting and um, I'm just sort of curious if you had always kind of envisioned like these different creatures as a part of the book or if that was something that you found along the way when you were writing. Yeah, they were always here. So yeah, it's not a spoiler because they are on the cover, but there are tigers in this book. And <laughs> tigers do not actually roam the American West in addition to the jackals. Um, that for me was kind of like a sort of like flag in the ground I wanted to plant early on to, to say that this book is not um, straightforward, realistic historical fiction, which I think has always been a fear of mine that it would be read in exactly that way. 
Um, and so, you know, like tigers are sort of like one element of Chinese mythology that I was familiar with growing up. And I was like, I'm just going to import them, sort of like leave my own print, so to speak, on this landscape and signal to people that maybe you shouldn't take everything in this book as a straightforward reality. Um, but the great thing is that I think almost like, I, I, I don't know, like they, they're so woven into the fabric of the, the, the story of the characters and the history they're living in that I was just like, wait a second. Like, do I have to look things up? Especially with, you know, Jag uh, Jackers, uh, sorry, Jackals, I was just like, did I miss something? Like, you know, cause I'm always just like, was I a little dumb and I missed a part of history? Like they, they just felt like so there. And you know, even the tigers, which I know we're not, but, um, and I think that like had this great way of making like the reader feel like the characters where it's like you he hear about these things and you sort of glancingly can see them or have experiences with them. Um, but it's just all these stories that you can either believe or not. Um, and I really love that aspect of it. Um, was there any, um, when it came to like kind of choosing these animals or anything like that or writing them in, like was there any sort of decisions that you made or things you wanted to focus on? Well, yeah, I think the tigers were deliberate about everything else. It's just like, I think this is a cool animal and it's in this book. I just like, or earlier this year when we were still allowed to like go outdoors and hear people speak, I heard Jeff Vandermeer speak about how he thinks that in a lot of his books, he just like has an animal he's obsessed with and that animal becomes like the loci of the book for whatever subconscious reason. Like, yeah, I like, I vibe with that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Yeah, that really is a good, as, a good reason as any. <laughs> so I, like, I wanna, yeah, kind of just like take this moment to ask like quarantine questions, just, you know, like, where are you at? and and, and how are you doing? And, you know, how do you kind of feel like you feel at the beginning of this um, book tour, which is not as maybe you had ever thought it would be just this totally different, uh, maybe alien thing and, and how that has been. Yeah, um, so I'm in San Francisco right now, and it's like hard because I, and it's not hard, it's weird because like, you know, on a surface level, I have all my creature comforts, like I've been doing grocery delivery as an incredibly lazy person for a really long time, I have like these lovely pets to distract me, etc. Um, I think it's just more that all of us are, you know, sitting in a state of existential fear and sort of like crouched and prepared for grief to come at us because it is, it is going to come at us and is already yeah, has begun already, especially in New York, where you and books are and our magic are. Um, but I think for me, like, my particular book has been, like, very lucky to have a lot of media attention, and so, like, honestly, books live very long lives, and so I'm, like, a little bit sad, but I'm less worried for that than, like, you know, for the future of independent bookstores, so um, just want to take this moment again to say what I should have earlier, which is, like, I don't care if you order my book, but please order some books from Books Are Magic or from, or from your local indie or from bookshop.org. Um, I just ordered this really cool sounding book called Tales of the Sahara from Books Are Magic, and I'm really excited for it to show up um, in my mailbox one day soon. That's yeah. Awesome. That's, yeah. And I concur. Yeah, order any book, but definitely order Pam's book. <laughs> I think, I think hopefully you already want to. Um, if you have any good sense, but um, yeah, so okay, I will just uh, I want to ask more about like I guess um, I'm curious about like the sibling relationship because I just feel like it's so hard to get that exact sort of um, proportion of hate, love, irritation, um, and and also just make it feel like a very distinct sibling relationship, like these two siblings, Sam and Lucy, as opposed to, it's very annoying to have a sibling, you know? And so I'm curious about the process about that and like what inspired you to write this? Yeah, um, I think I'm always, I'm fascinated by any kind of relationship where two people live or, maybe not live, but where two people are in some kind of proximity and it may be physical proximity, but it may also just be like a weird emotional proximity and where they are always being compared to each other. Um, 
I'm just like really, really fascinated by that. So like I'm fascinated by sibling relationships. I'm also fascinated by like close female relationships because I think there's a little bit of that. And so the book has kind of, I guess, parts of both those aspects. Um, and what I really find fascinating about siblings and families in particular is just like how much damage you can do to that relationship and sort of like punch it without it fully breaking like it just sort of like warps and then like survives in like a new but screwed up shape uh, and that's really fascinating to me because there's so much like contradiction in close familial relationships like you may love someone more than you've ever loved someone and you also hate them more than you've ever hated them and they're also capable of annoying you um, at the slightest provocation yeah absolutely i really like the way you described it like how much how much can you buck this up <laughs> like or actually it's it's almost like you will always maybe be able to have this relationship but like you, you can one can fuck it up so much more right yes. Because yes. Of this kind <laughs> you know, it's a terrible way to put it right but it is it is like no. family and family relationships are some of those rare relationships where like yeah, I don't know. Like, I think emotions are sort of allowed to go to in a dream because no, you probably won't be in that relationship forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, to that end, like, I also um, just want to ask about, you know, um, the parents, right? Because this is like very much an immigrant story and a story of parents, right? And, and our parents and like what they did before they were somebody's parents and um maybe again to you know speak to what you were saying like how much people can can mess up and 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 maybe be horrible abusive but also have so much else to them as well like so, so much love and kindness and caring and i think one of the things i really loved and found very true about this book was you know uh the mother and the father are described in these ways where like you know, you see a lot of the the bad they do, and you see a lot of the good they do, and it, it doesn't even shake out to good and bad. Like, there's no kind of decision made on what they were, which I thought was very beautiful and true. Mm. And um, I wanted to ask you about, especially like kind of the process of writing about like, you know, immigration and what it is to kind of be the child of immigrants, and mm. also, you know, what it is to immigrate here. Yeah, um, I'm glad to hear that it resonated with you. I think that's something I began realizing really only in my sort of like mid-ish 20s. Um, so around the time I was writing this book is like, it was very easy for me growing up to be like, yeah, my parents were like terrible to me. They never let me have these things. They're like, whatever. Um, but eventually to realize that part of that was that they didn't tell me stories about all the hardships they had gone through in order to like get themselves in my in my family here um they would actually have preferred to leave that in the past and so a lot of that occlusion was actually in their minds an act of kindness which is definitely not the way i perceived it um and i've had a lot of conversations with friends who are the children of immigrants who feel that exact same way and have like in their early, like mid late 20s and even beyond suddenly learned like ridiculous like epic monumental stories about their parents when they were younger um and yeah that was just something i wanted to acknowledge in this book so like the book um the structure of the book is such that it starts right in like the book's present which is when lucy and sam's father dies um and then it goes back one layer into the past and then it goes back another layer into the past which is like their parents past and it was because i actually felt that i couldn't emotionally proceed forward in the story without like sort of like nodding to what the parents had experienced and i don't want to say debt because that's not the right word but some word that's kind of close to debt um about what yeah about what children think about their parents and how much we can just never truly know them mm -hmm. um i wanted to also i just ask like i think when you were saying what parents reminded me of the thing that i thought was so amazing and gross and beautiful and um you know i think you know i think it's it's clear that the father has died right at the uh, beginning of the book and uh i think just to go back to how you know i i think the natural world is described so beautifully like i 
that involves like gross shit. And I think that that is also um, kind of described in detail with like the care and attention and lyricism that other things that are maybe more obviously beautiful are. And um, so I wanted to ask you about like, just kind of like bodies and, and just how you kind of, you know, you, you, there's this kind of reimagined West, but also like how you square that dream with also just the reality of what it is to live in a body and like how much fucking trouble it is and, and how, you know, what happens to it. Yeah, I think it's it's similar to my answer about uh, the natural world earlier is like, I do think bodies are kind of like gross and repugnant and do lots of extremely unpleasant things um, to and with us. And I just wanted to write into that space. And I also think that, you know, as um, because these characters are in many ways, like very emotionally oppressed, have like, difficulty expressing themselves, but it's just so true of a lot of people in the real world. Um, I think there are ways in which I think attention from the writer to the body instead of the dialogue is actually more indicative of sort of like the emotional truth of what's going on. And yeah, and also I think like in particular, um, yeah, there are a lot of descriptions of like a rotting, a rotting corpse in this book. Um, and I think that part of that is that the way I see it, attention is love. Um, time spent on something is love. And these children in particular, because they immediately have to sort of like run for their lives, they don't have the time and the space to grieve in what would be, I guess, like a more traditional way. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a strange way, their attention on that like disgusting, fucked up body that is still their father's body is, is a form of like grieving, grieving and honor and love. Yeah. No, oh, absolutely. Um, so I think that it's um, maybe going to be almost time to open up to uh, questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask you one more. And if people haven't put in their questions yet, start or keep doing that. Um, so I, I was just curious, like what works, you know, both literary and not. Uh, did you see how much of these hills is gold in, in conversation with or, or just books that like or anything, right? literally anything, even half of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? Like, was this in conversation with and also inspired by or anti-inspired by? Because I also love an anti-inspiration. Ooh, that's, that's like a nice, a good petty um, question. I sadly don't have one for that this book, but I will have to think about it. Um, but as far as uh, straightforward non-anti-inspirations, um, uh really love Toni Morrison's Beloved. Um, I think it deals really well with like traumatic memory and hauntings and it's just like incredibly beautiful. Um, I really love Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber, which is this like really rad short story collection that also is like concerned with with like bodies and um and weirdness and mythologies. And there's also this like book that I read a lot in my 20, early 20s when I was moving around and asking myself um, that question of where home is called Goodbye Chunky Rice. And it's a graphic novel um, about- a Craig Thompson, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. God, yeah. When we read it, it's, it's, it's so hard to describe. It's about, the main characters are a turtle and a mouse deer, which is different from a deer mouse one of the other whatever and it's just like the story of like two friends and one of them has to move away um and it's really beautiful and everyone should read it um just like a quick like sidebar question like are there any westerns or like kind of western like western films or books that you also like really yeah react to or against I mean, like Steinbuck was so important to me and I haven't read him in a while, so I don't know if I like still stand by this, um, but he does do so well at capturing the landscape of, of like California, Central Northern California in particular. Um, I just actually reread all of the Little House on the Prairie series because it was so formative to me as a kid. Uh -huh. um, and I highly suggest reading that in companionship with this book. I might have it here. Um, this book called Prairie Fires, which is a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder that came out, I think, two years ago, um, and is really, really fascinating. It's, it just sort of, like, points to everything in her life and how, yeah, her books were, her books are actually, you know, marketed as, like, biographical, like, pretty much straight from her life, but there was so much fine tuning of the details she did in order to create this, like, mythology of the American West where, like, 
individual rugged individualism and like hard work could you know meant that your family would succeed even though that was like so far away from the reality that her family lived it's it's a really great biography mm -hmm. i wrote that down yeah i really want to read that i love those books just like maybe even just purely for the sense details like mm. what they do with the the pig after butchering right <laughs> everyone's really into that like every part gets used and just like it, it's got that like kind of little kid obsession with like little treats and mm -hmm. like kind of finding like the sweetness and the joy where you can um even though there's also like a lot of bad stuff right in the you know yeah. little house books like yeah so i really want to read prairie fires thank you um i'm just going to start with this question um see from glory ann uh this is a great question because i also had wondered about this uh the table of contents and the section titles are so interesting can you talk a little about how they came to be hi glory thanks for asking that question so i'm gonna just like briefly hold this up um so the table of contents is basically every chapter has a little one word title and as you can see this is part one and part two um in every section of the book except for the third one the same chapter title is repeat um and that was just like a really fun device that I added in actually like pretty late in the drafting process of this book. The titles weren't there from the beginning, but I put them there because I was like, I want to feel like there's like a little bit of a like a structure or like an idea in my mind that each chapter is centered around. And I was like, I'll just like delete them later. Um, I ended up not deleting them because I think I had a lot of fun with them and it really spoke to a theme of the book that was important to me, which is how sort of like pain and trauma gets like carried down through generations of a family when it's not addressed and like the same sort of like troubles get surfaced over and over, whether or not characters are aware of them being the same troubles. Yeah, and I just I just loved how it's elemental it was and that the, yeah, that they were repeated. Um, like it, it, I mean, I think I hadn't seen that before in that way and it, I was just like, this is so right and perfect. Yeah, I don't know if you feel this way about your writing, but sometimes it's most rewarding to sort of like have Easter eggs for yourself as a writer. It's like no one in the world who's reading it may ever get it, but it made me, it made me happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I mean, also any, yeah, anything also to keep happy, right, during like a long project <laughs> is just a boon. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to ask about, uh, okay, so this is a question, a question from, um, Kristen Lorich, uh, can you talk more about your writing process, um, what research looked like for the book, and where you saw it kind of inspiration and motivations with the ebbs and flows of your creative process? Um, hi, Kristen. Thanks for asking. Um, so for me, I am a big believer in not forcing writing when you're not feeling it. I'm definitely not a like sit down and write every day. There are probably stretches of time when I haven't written for weeks, months, even years, and definitely in a month stage right now. Um, and so for this book, you know, the first chapter uh, was a standalone short story at first. I wrote it and then I kind of like left it alone for many months while like the rest of the book coalesced in my mind. Um, and it wasn't until like I knew the entire like rough shape of the book and I had this urgency. It was really like, it was like building up in me um, that I then sat down and wrote the first draft like very quickly in a stretch of, of a couple of, of weeks. Um, but that was only, I think just like, I'm really interested in separating out like writing, which is like actually putting down words on the page from the rest of the writing process, which is, I consider like those months that I wasn't actually writing to also be writing if that answers your question. Great. All right. I'm just going to ask this from Angela. Uh, this is a, a two-parter. Uh, so the first part, you know, what was your journey like as a writer, especially throughout your 20s? And do you have any suggestions or tips for aspiring writers? And, you know, sort of the second part is how do you approach personal pieces, um, like your one for The New Yorker uh, versus fiction? Hmm. Okay, so the first one, um, I can tell you what I did. I don't know if I recommend it, <laughs> but uh, basically I feel like my early 20s were trying very desperately to not be a writer until it became clear that nothing else would make me happy. Um, so I actually like worked a full-time job in tech in San Francisco and really threw myself into that career right after I graduated college. It was like, this is a great job, like I have like great benefits, I have friends, et cetera, maybe this is the thing that's gonna make me happy. Um, and then once I realized that that wasn't going to work, then 
I gave myself a year to see if I would actually write if given the time. And so that was the way I did it. Again, don't know if I recommend it. Um, and then the second part about writing personal pieces, honestly, they're really hard for me and like my, my complete admiration for people who write memoir and nonfiction because writing that personal essay um, around the time of this book release basically broke me <laughs> for like many, many months. Um, so also don't know if I recommend doing what I did. Have you written many um, like nonfiction pieces or essays or is this, was it, is it something that you do more rarely? You know, what's really funny is my undergraduate degree is actually in creative nonfiction. Um, I went to this like liberal arts college where they let us like read lyric essays. And I was like, what is this? What's a lyric essay? I love this. And so I actually uh, like my thesis in college was like a eight part lyric essay. Ridiculous. Um, but once I left college, I realized that without deadlines, I'm just like so lazy as a writer that I couldn't get any nonfiction done without a deadline. Um, and so that's, that was my journey. But I think that I really love reading like contemporary experimental and lyric nonfiction because I think you can steal a lot of techniques and bring them back to fiction. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, so next question um, I'm going to ask is from Benjamin, Benjamin Schaefer. I'd be curious to hear you talk more about your use of mythology in the book. You've mentioned your interest in interrogating the myth of the American West and the inclusion of the tiger from Chinese mythology, but you also use mythology to, uh, to confront the character's identities. For Sam, the mythology of the self as it relates to gender, and for Lucy, mythology regarding her vocation at the end of the book. How do you see all these mythic threads or mythology in general operating in the book? Mm. Uh, hi, Benjamin. Benjamin uh, is one of the editors of the Fairy Tale Review, which is an amazing publication for anyone interested in this topic. Um, so yeah, I do think that both characters sort of like uh, really find themselves drawn to different kinds of mythologies in order basically to validate their experiences and their modes of life. Um, in the case of Sam, they're more like straightforward mythologies and other like literal, you know, stories of like tigers and buffaloes and for Lucy I think the kind of mythology that she actually finds herself drawn to is the kind of mythology that exists in history books um and yeah I think that I and I call those history books mythologies because they very much are they're very much like narratives that are crafted and picked from an assortment of facts um for a purpose and yeah I think that you know I, I know we talk a lot about like representation in narrative and in literature and in film. And I do think that is important because like mythologies, even in the form of like fucking like Disney movies that we watch, for example, um, they're really, really important in shaping the identities of children and allowing them to like, sort of like see ways to proceed in the world. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, here's a question from Let's see, um, it's either K who or K -hu, uh, it's K H U. Uh, this epigram was very compelling. I almost feel like the book was a forceful response to abolish the statement of the epigram. How did you come about choosing this epigram? Hmm. So the epigraph of the book is um, "This land is not your land." I actually find it really fascinating that you you thought the book abolished it by the end. Um, and I think that's really, really wonderful. I guess I, as a writer, I'm not sure if it did. Um, and I'm totally open to interpretations of it. But that epigraph was really formative because one, like the tigers, it was like a stake in the ground that was, in some ways, the message is for the reader, right? The epigraph is about not taking this at face value. Um, and it is a little bit of a statement of how the characters feel like they're sort of shut out from allowing to say that they are citizens of this land that they have a claim in this land um and it is something that they grapple with but i'm glad that's what you took away from it so i think we have time for about two more questions before we wrap up um so um let's see i'm going to ask uh this is kind of like a nitty-gritty writing question i'm very curious about this what was your revision process like? And this is from Brandon C. 
Hi, Brandon. Um, my revision process felt endless. Um, so the first stage was after I wrote that first draft, which um, I really say draft loosely. It was like the ugliest thing I've ever written and I had to let go of that. Um, I actually put the book away for I think like somewhere between four to six months and just did not look at it and tried to forget about it. And then when I next opened the document, I literally had forgotten some of the things that happened. A lot of it didn't make any sense. There's like no logic to like why a character did this and then suddenly showed up doing a completely different thing in the next scene. Um, and so what I realized I had to do is I had to throw away like basically the whole draft and just like kind of write it from scratch again. And so for me, because I'm such a sentence person, I just, I don't know, I couldn't like sort of like dart in and out of revision. Every single draft I had to start like in a new document. In some cases I had the old document next to me and would like retype a couple of things, but most times it sort of just like went off the rails and I had to write it again. Um, and it sucked. <laughs> um, that's just nice to hear that revision sucks and resulted in this book. So thanks for that. <laughs> it uh, always sucks. I'm, I'm like a firm believer in like anyone who's writing your first draft for a novel, which I think is very different for me from than a for a short story. The first draft is going to be ugly. And the sooner you sort of like let go of the assumption that you can make something beautiful in the first go around, it's, it just goes much easier. Yes, yes. Um, so I will, um, right now I have a question from Aaron. Um, he says, uh, I heard a recent interview with you by Scott Simon on NPR in which he asked some rather strange questions, pushing back on your portrayal of Chinese immigrants in the US by saying they were also escaping servitude in China. I thought you dealt with the questions extremely well, but did this bother you? And have you received any similar reactions from other white journalists? And thank you for, and look forward to reading the book. Hmm, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, it did. I guess like there's two parts of it, which I feel like you have to like sort of two consciousnesses consciousnesses that you have to have is like one is like yes, it always bothers me, but two is that also you have to like you kind of learn during the book publicity process to um, sort of like I guess like take the reins <laughs> of something for yourself. And so like, I was like, in that moment, it was like, I could decide to like get angry about the question, but then the entire conversation would be about that question that I didn't like, or I could turn it around a little bit. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the answer. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, okay, so I think I'm just, yeah, we're gonna have to stop there, but I just want to say, um, yeah, everybody, please buy Pam's book from Books Are Magic or another indie, uh, because I think that uh, how much of these hills is gold right here is, um, I don't know, I just like, I think I did not know that this was the book I really, really fucking wanted to read. And that the, the sort of like, um, the, everything it pulls off and is about and, and reimagines is, is kind of so... Uh, seamless and unbothered. I know it's not unbothered to write, but like so kind of unbothered and and like just you just feel like the force of it reading it that like why wasn't this always here and why didn't we always have it and I loved it so much. So thank you so much Pam. Thank you Alice. Thanks for donating part of your evening um, and thanks to Squid for making an appearance and everyone for joining. Yeah, where's your cat at? Back there? Yeah, there. Everyone's asleep. I don't know if you can see. There's like the dog, That's so cool. and then there's the cat asleep on the couch. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, Pam.